Dr. Ali Zentner has had an up and down battle with obesity. Her personal weight gain has spiraled out of control over and over again. At her peak, she weighed something like 322 pounds. Well, not anymore. But she does know about changing eating habits to prevent obesity. She's an internal medicine physician trained in cardiology. And to celebrate her 40th birthday, she climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ellie Zentner back to Studio 4 to tell us more. How are you? Fine. I've been busy. You have <laughs> been busy. And like some people turn 40 and go to Vegas. I, I'll tell you. And this. drink a lot, yes. not you. Yeah, no, and it's funny, as we stood, I went with my husband, who I is such a dear to be dragged along, and we stood in front of this massive monstrosity, and he turned to me and said, you couldn't just go to Vegas and wear a tiara. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could. But maybe it didn't feel uh, so life-affirming. You know what it was, Fanny? I wanted a I wanted a grand gesture. I wanted something that would be exactly life affirming. Um, I think in life it's important to see what you can do, mm -hmm. and uh, and this new phase of physical fitness and health in my life, I wanted something that was really going to test my boundaries, so to speak, mentally and physically and also be a really memorable experience. I'm sure, and you dealt with the altitude and all of that and trying to find a place to uh, relieve. relieve yourself. Yes, yes. so, um, you know, we, we, um, we dealt with the altitude, we took medication and, mm. and, and we spoke with several physicians. I did a lot of research on my own to find out about altitude sickness and what things to watch for. And we had a wonderful crew with us, 41 porters took five people up a mountain. It was amazing. Oh my. Yeah, um, and they spoke English. They all spoke English. I learned a little Swahili, so that mm -hmm. was uh, it. Was it was just a great experience okay. overall. Okay, would you go back to Tanzania? I would go back to Africa, Africa. East Africa. I would go back mm -hmm. to Tanzania in a minute. Would I climb that mountain again? <laughs> no. Okay, <laughs> so there were a few things you didn't know, and it was a challenge, but you were down and safe, and still working at helping people shed pounds yes I, I not get fat in the first place I, I think that the you know just back to the idea of Kilimanjaro it's interesting when we got off the mountain I remember saying to my guide he said how was it and I said I think that the impact of this experience will really hit me six months or a year or two years from now and that's pretty much what it's done it's had this wonderful ripple effect mm. down the road every sure. day uh, uh, test yourself physically move yourself ahead mentally uh, you know, mentally it was huge. I, they talk about sort of three buckets on Kilimanjaro. You have an altitude bucket, you have a physical bucket, and you have a mental bucket. And you try and figure out which of those. The, the altitude bucket you cannot predict. Uh, the physical and the mental bucket, the physical bucket you can really train for. The mental bucket you figure mm. out who you're made of. Well, any great athlete will tell you that. Yeah. Mm, the uh, Canucks today, as you know, are, are going into their yes. mental buckets. They're going into their, tapping into their mental sure, buckets. Sure, physically they've got it. Yes, they do. Mentally they're going to have to come back. Just absolutely. a titch. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So uh, after 10 days up Kilimanjaro, I'm sure it was more a mental thing than a physical thing, or not? Um, I think it's a bit of both, absolutely. You know, you, you can train as much as you want, and I'm someone who physical activity is really a huge part of my everyday, and I always try and train for sort of the next race or the next triathlon or the next adventure. But mentally, um, you really do realize what you're made of with every, I think, and mm -hmm. everyone's like that. Mm -hmm. I think with every challenge we face, this just happened to be a self-imposed challenge. Exactly. All. But you also beat another thing, and that was yes. 322 pounds. Well, and... Or I, less. Um, I, I would say it's beating, you know, um, and that's the issue with obesity. You just, we talked about climate change and global mm -hmm. warming, and I think obesity is to medicine what global warming is to the environmental field. This is is our in medicine this is our great um, uh, uh, mountain so to speak to conquer and and it's something that we constantly have to battle and and you know I, I do focus on treatment but I also focus on prevention I think that's key is addressing y you know um, younger patients or addressing families and preventing weight gain which can be as significant as treating weight gain and how dangerous is weight gain really to our health uh, let's start with our hearts so you know recent trial published in the journal the American Medical Association it's actually no longer even recent 
recent, it's about a, almost a year old now, shows that uh, a body mass index of 25 to 50 increases a person's risk of developing a heart attack or a stroke by 40%. Really? 25 to 50? And what does that mean? So that means any patient who's overweight to obese. Um, you know, in Canada, we're looking at a third of our population. There was just the recent, uh, in 2010, we released the Canadian Health Survey, which showed that about 35 to 40 percent of Canadians, depending on men or women, were either overweight or obese in this country. BC fortunately has the lowest rates of obesity, about 20 percent obese. Mm -hmm about 30 percent uh, of people in this country have a body mass index over 25. So we're talking a third of our population has a 40 percent increased risk of stroke purely associated with this disease itself and you know when we talk about government policies and we talk about reshaping what our future looks like and planning ahead even from an environmental perspective mm -hmm. this is something that healthcare needs to step up we we don't have programs to address this issue it's it's been very much a wait and see attitude and deal with the diseases as they pop up and uh making the link between if you are overweight you could die younger absolutely uh die from something terrible and, and again, there's there's a variety. So as with any disease, there's low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And obesity confers that too. And this is where you know I really empower patients because there is a, such a thing as a low risk obese patient, a moderate risk obese patient, and a high risk obese patient. And one of the ways to take yourself from a moderate or a higher risk patient down a step is to exercise. And the studies show, for example, that uh, it will take women, for example, an obese woman who exercises drops her risk of cardiovascular vascular disease in half. Okay, so exercise, crucial. Huge, and in fact, from a diabetes perspective, there's large-scale trials that have been published even in the last month. There's a large-scale meta-analysis in the Journal of the American Medical Association that shows that moderate to vigorous exercise, so we're talking 30 to 45 minutes, five days a week or more, dramatically reduces a person's risk of developing diabetes. And if you're diabetic, it will actually drop your blood sugars by mm. as much as 1%. Do you believe you can reverse diabetes? Absolutely. Uh, reverse heart disease? Uh, I don't think you can reverse heart disease per se. So if you have plaques laid down in your blood vessels, they're staying there. But I think you can stabilize the course. And I, mm. I, and, and you know, it's interesting sort of paralleling my experience with Kilimanjaro. You know, life's what you make it. And I think that the mm -hmm. key here is, sure, y we can all sort of sit down and accept our fates, or we can climb mountains and see what happens. Well, exactly, or have a big scare and then and then change your lifestyle. But sometimes that big scare is sudden death, as you know. Absolutely, and I think that I, I always say to patients, you know, the goal here in life is bad things happen to good people. Don't be the person wheeling into the emergency room going, why did this happen to me? You know, be the person who's being wheeled in and, and in your mind, you've done everything in your power and this is just bad luck. When are you diagnosed with type two diabetes, likely? So the, there are criteria for diagnosis, and according to the Canadian Diabetes Association and the American Diabetes Association, we agree um, that it, a diagnosis of diabetes is two fasting sugars above seven or a two-hour glucose tolerance test. And what that is is we do a fasting sugar, and then we give you 30 grams of sugary drink, and we wait two right. hours and do a repeat test of a, a, a two-hour glucose of, of 11 or higher. And in Canada, you need either a two fasting sugars or one fasting sugar and one two hours. So you need two consecutive tests. And what's going on in our bodies? if we're type 2 diabetic? So uh, ty type 2 diabetes, and there's a huge distinction between type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a totally different disease uh, in that the pancreas in type 1 diabetes has an autoimmune reaction and the cells that make insulin start to die, and so it's an absolute deficit of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, what you start off with is what's called insulin insensitivity. So for whatever reason, and there's a variety of factors, it's why, for example, obesity is so linked, the body becomes insensitive to insulin, and you have what's called insulin resistance. Insulin levels rise in the body, paradoxically, interestingly. Even though sugar is high, insulin levels are actually very high because insulin's not getting into the cell and allowing sugar to get into the cell. So what pumps out insulin, the pancreas? The pancreas pumps out insulin. Pumps out insulin. Yes. If you're type 2 diabetic, it does work, your pancreas. Your pancreas works, especially in the initial phases, but it's like a key in the lock. So what's happening is for what a variety of reasons, 
um, the key isn't fitting into the lock and there's an imbalance in the body between the feedback system of sugar production and insulin production and you have initially a phase of what's called insulin insensitivity or insulin resistance and eventually over time usually it takes about a decade the pancreas starts to Okay, and does that affect all your other organs? Absolutely. So what happens is this excess amount of glucose causes what's called glycosylation in the vessels, and it sort of literally damages the lining of the vessels. These, uh, we call them advanced uh, glycosylated end products. They are sort of literally like chunks that get left on the side of the road along right. blood vessels. And if you think about it, if it's the vessels to the eyes, blindness, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in this country. In the limbs, we're talking about uh, vascular disease in the limbs, and in the small blood, uh, small nerves supplying the nerves to the hands and the feet, lack of nerve sensation, bigger vessels, we're talking heart disease and stroke. Okay, so to prevent it, yes, eat less. I know you're going to say that. You know what? Or eat differently. What? Um, and in fact, it's a variety of things. So, so the, the obesity debate rages on, just like in any new science, which is ironic because this is such an old disease. Mm -hmm. um, it is really more uh, than just eating less and moving more. This is a disease like any other, and to sort of sum it down to just eat less and move more really isn't the case. Okay. It's why many restrictive weight loss programs only work for short periods of time because our body's more complicated than that. But I think looking at what we, we can all make a difference. It's like we talked about global warming. I mean, just because certain things are beyond our control doesn't mean we shouldn't recycle mm -hmm. and, and, and right. use less carbon. But you saw that on Kilimanjaro, although you hadn't yes. climbed before, you saw the melting glaciers. I, I so was you talking know. earlier that, you know, you get mm -hmm. to the top and there's three little glaciers. Exactly, and, yeah. much different than you Although know, 20, I've not been before, 30, 40 years ago, but yes. the scientists tell us so. I, I think with obesity, every little bit does help. And mm. we're not talking about getting to goal weight here in Canada. We're talking about making, you know, taking a bite, so to speak, excuse the pun, or making an impact in the diseases that obesity causes. And the interesting thing is even an obese diabetic can lower their blood sugars by as much as a medication with 45 minutes of physical activity okay, four so days Physical activity or certain foods you just simply don't eat, stay uh, away from, you know, or it doesn't matter. Staying away from higher caloric, higher fat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, higher uh, refined sugar foods. I would say that probably the biggest misconception is, you know, we we eat a lot of refined sugar in this country in the form of high fructose corn syrup, which is th the evidence suggests that it, there is a huge link between high fructose corn syrup juices, for example, um, and a lot of our sweeteners, it's a cheap sweetener, mm -hmm. between that and high blood pressure. And what about trans fats? Uh, you know, the trans fat debate lingers on, absolutely. There's been a, 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 you have to be careful with many of these nutritional recommendations and nutritionism and uh, the sort of industry that follows. You know, we saw, look, we were selling candy like crazy licorice and and jujubes and calling it trans fat free I mean I there's a bit of perspective yeah, here so head. to speak absolutely mm -hmm. so I think that that concept of nutritionism of just one thing being uh, the the devil so to speak you know the devil's in the details <laughs> I know and we've always said eat less mostly fruits and vegetables and it's a lot better I, I must admit I'm a big fan Michael Pollan has a, a yeah. fabulous philosophy and it's a really simple one uh, eat less uh, most mostly plants kind of mm -hmm. uh, concept and there is something to the concept that if your grandmother wouldn't recognize it stay away from it <laughs> that's good if your grandmother wouldn't recognize it stay away from it stay away from it and yeah. eat the colors of the rainbow I mean we hear so yes. much in, in but fact it's complicated in fact the uh, the um, American uh, the um, the Americans have just adopted they've abandoned the food pyramid and adopted the Finally. the food plate so that your plate should be half vegetables and fruit, not fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. uh, a quarter starch and a quarter protein. Uh, and that's interesting because that's now sparking a huge debate among the obesity community of is right. this the way to go. But if you do eat half, you don't deprive yourself. No, absolutely. You just eat less and it works. Uh, and again, there's, uh, as we talked about earlier, there is a huge feedback mechanism that this um, this doesn't acknowledge. There's a hedonistic part of our brain. There is mm -hmm. uh, definitely, um, you know, a, a hormonal a feedback mechanism that exists in the pleasure center of our brain that delegates for patients hunger and satiety, um, hedonistic approaches to food. The problem with food is this. What other substance on the planet is good for you, is enjoyable, and you need it to live? Mm -hmm. Well, 
That's a good question. I can't think of the answer. Yeah. Congratulations Thanks for very much climbing for that me. mountain. Yeah, it was fun. Nice Thanks. to see you again. Nice to see you. Uh, Dr. Ellie Zentner.